So we just want to welcome everyone again to CILC's Community of Learning. We are so excited to be here with you. So I can't wait to jump in and learn along with all of you. So I'm going to hand it over to the wonderful Teacher Kevin. Teacher Kevin, we're so excited you're back with us again this Friday. Tell us, what are we learning about today? Well, first off, let me say hello, as always, every week, Teacher Allison, and hello to everybody who's joining us uh, everywhere you're coming in from. So many wonderful places. I'm seeing places like uh, New York and New Jersey, uh, as far out as Italy. That's so impressive. I know there's so many things you could be doing today, and I'm so, so lucky to have you all here. So hello and welcome. My name is Kevin Impelizzeri. You can call me Mr. Kevin. My pronouns are he and him, and I'm a teacher over at the Penn Museum. Uh, and welcome, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If it's your second time, if it's your fifth time, it's your 30th time, welcome so much. And thank you so much for joining us today for At Home Anthropology Live. Every week, we broadcast live from the Penn Museum and share you information about archaeology, anthropology, and civilizations all around the world, past and present. So we're really, really excited to have you here because today... We're going to be learning about Roman mosaics. We're going to be learning about ancient Rome and a very, very popular design of decorative floor that the Romans developed, or at least the Romans uh, uh, were have found popular. They weren't the ones originally developed, it, but uh, we're going to learn a whole bunch about that. We're going to learn about some history, and we're going to think like archaeologists, uh, and we're going to learn how to design our own as well. Uh, so again, welcome. Uh, we're so excited to have you here. And so before we dive into our topic today, uh, why don't we uh, tell you a little? Why don't I tell you a little bit more about about who we are, what we do here at the Penn Museum? So the Penn Museum is a short name for the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. We were founded in 1887 by the University of Pennsylvania as a place to teach, learn, understand, and share information about the fields of archeology span and anthropology. Now we'll start with anthropology first, because anthropology is the study of us. It's the study of people past and present. And anthropologists, the people who study anthropology, they do that through lots of different ways. So for example, they study their culture. And culture is basically Everything that makes a group of people a unique group of people. So things like, you know, what kinds of things do they create? How do they think about the world? What information do they share? What achievements do they have? Um, our anthropologists also study things like language. Uh, how we get the things that are in our heads, these ideas here, and share them with other people, both written and spoken language, and how those change over time. Uh, anthropologists study things like environment, uh, how climate how disease, how diet, all these things affect civilizations. And we do those through the lens of archaeology. Archaeology is the study of people from the past or the things they left behind. And archaeologists, they study artifacts. And you can see examples of Penn Museum teachers and scientists uh, sharing information about archaeology. We have over 1 million artifacts uh, here at the Penn Museum, which we learn to, again, better understand humanity itself. Um, the Penn Museum is located... Uh, we are in uh, on the University of Pennsylvania campus. You can actually see uh, Penn Hospital behind the building right over here. And we're again located on the Penn campus in a section of the city of Philadelphia called University City. And Philadelphia is in southeastern Pennsylvania. It's the largest city in the state. And we're here in the United States of America, on North America, on planet Earth. And I bring up all of those names because names, space, and place are so, so important. And there's another important name you need to know about here that was there before there was a Penn Museum, before there was a Philadelphia, before there was even a United States, there was Lenape Hooking. So here's Philadelphia. It's also known as Lenape Hooking. Lenape Hoking is the ancestral and spiritual homeland of the Lenape. The Lenape live, uh, have connections over 4,000 years to this parts of the world, living in what are known today as the U.S. states of uh, Pennsylvania, particularly eastern Pennsylvania, uh, good parts of what is now New Jersey, New York, uh, Delaware, and Maryland. Uh, and again, there's long ties uh, to this space, to the Lenape. In 1682, an English colonizer named William Penn uh, entered a purchase deal with a, with a group of the Lenape uh, who lived in what is now southeastern Pennsylvania, where the Penn Museum is now called the Unami Lenape. Uh, and he entered a purchase deal with the Lenape to help form the, the colony of Pennsylvania, buying parts of their land. 
But later English colonizers, including Penn's own sons, did not think that was enough and created a fraudulent treaty called the Walking Purchase Deed of 1737, which they use as an excuse to force the Lenape off their land and push them and other local nations westward. However, the Lenape are still around. The Lenape still have very strong connections to Lenape hooking and going back 4,000 years. And they live on today and they carry on the traditions of their of their communities uh, in living in places in what are known today as the U.S. states of Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, Wisconsin, and New Jersey, as well as the Canadian province of Ontario. So here, here in Philadelphia, here in Lenape Hoking, here at the Penn Museum, we study archaeology. And so then what does an archaeologist, what does the person who studies archaeology do? And an archaeology is the study of people from the past through the things they left behind. And to do that, archaeologists study these things called artifacts. Artifacts are basically anything that people have made, anything that people have had influence over uh, are artifacts. And artifacts can teach us a lot about different communities around the world. And what archaeologists do is they go to different places. They go and uncover these artifacts, and they try to carefully study and examine them and see what they can tell us about different communities. And archaeology is a really, really interesting field because in some ways, archaeology and learning about a people uh, through artifacts is like putting together pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And like when you're solving it, when you're putting together a jigsaw puzzle, you are uncovering pieces and you sh carefully look at those pieces and you try to see how those pieces fit together in the hopes of creating a bigger picture uh, to get a better understanding of that community by piecing together things like artifacts. Now, what's a challenge of archaeology, though, is that there are often some things we're never going to know. We may know, for example, how old an artifact is relatively. Uh, we may know how it was made, uh, but we may never know what that artifact meant to the person who made it or the person who owned it, unless we have some kind of source related to them where they share their information. Unless we know them personally and they've talked to us, which can be very, very hard if a person, say, lived 4,000 years ago. So it's so archaeology in some cases is like putting together a puzzle where, where pieces are missing. And so then archaeologists then have to figure out what are those missing pieces? How do we create a bigger picture? And what they do is they share their knowledge. They share their information with other archaeologists. Uh, they build what's called context. Context is basically what do we know? about a community, about a culture, based on the information we have. And different archaeologists share different perspectives, because we all have different perspectives. And they share those ideas with other archaeologists and try to develop a better understanding of different peoples. And always, always, always trying to find more artifacts, more information, more context that can help us fill in those gaps and get us a better idea of the full picture. And this is what Penn Museum archaeologists are doing all over the world. Here's just some examples of Penn Museum archaeologists doing their jobs in all sorts of different places. They go on big journeys called expeditions. And they go even literally digging up artifacts. They do things called excavations, where they actually dig up things. And they try to learn more about, about different communities, about different cultures, to, again, expand our understanding of humanity. Uh, and both celebrate the things that make us similar and the things that make us different and unique. Uh, and so here we are today. I so said we're going to cover Roman mosaics. And that's because we're, we're kind of a special day today. Today is March the 15th. We're recording this today. Uh, and that was a date known to the Romans as the Ides of March. And I'm just going to go to the chat. I want to figure out what you already know about this. So go in the chat and just share... Uh, if you're familiar with the Ides of March, and what do you know about? It? What do you know about this? I've got a phrase up on the up on the the, the slide to help you better maybe think about this. Uh, the idea of beware the Ides of March. So so let's share in the chat. What do you know about the Ides of March? On James and Julius Caesar killed by Brutus. At two, Brutus. What else do we know? Uh, Caleb Ruder, that, that is a line. Uh, Beware the Ides of March is a line from William Shakespeare. 
uh, from the play, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. <laughs> Brea, you need to beware it. And if I know why you have to beware of the Ides of March. All right, why don't we learn a little bit of context? So the Ides, uh, the Ides of March, uh, is a term. So the Ides, uh, the Ides of a month, comes from the Latin word idura. Uh, for, uh, forgive my Latin pronunciation. Idur, idur, which means to divide, and and idur is basically in this context is the middle of the month. It's the dividing point of the beginning and the end of the month, first and the second half of the month. Uh, and in March, oh, some people I just learned that Romans called the first day of every month the Kalends and the middle day of the Ides. Yeah, uh, I didn't know about the, the Kalends. I knew about the Ides. So thank you for sharing that so much. Now, the Ides of March was important to the Romans because the Ides were important to, to the Romans in general because it generally coincided with the start of the full of the new full moon. Uh, which usually happened in the middle of the month. They're very lunar-based uh, time periods. A lot of civilizations around the world are like that. Um, and the Ides, uh, the Ides of the month were often a time of celebration to celebrate the coming of the new of the full moon. Uh, and oftentimes the Romans would hold feasts and sacrifices honoring the god Jupiter. Jupiter was the king of the gods to the Romans. It's the closest equivalent is if you've ever heard of Zeus, who was the king of the gods in Greece. Uh, the, Jupiter is kind of the equivalent of Zeus for the Romans. Uh, in fact, the Romans borrowed a lot of different gods from the Greeks and gave them different names. Jupiter was one of them. Um, However, it's not it's not just a day that was associated with celebration. The Ides of March is also is also known as a day of misfortune uh, because in 44 BCE, the Roman leader Julius Caesar was assassinated. Uh, he was assassinated not just by Brutus, is the famous line again from uh, the tragedy of Julius Caesar, et tu, Brute, uh, you too, Brutus, uh, 60 Roman senators uh, assassinated Julius Caesar in the Roman Senate. Um, and this, of course, was later than depicted, dramatized, uh, because we've been doing that kind of stuff for a long time. Uh, in the famous uh, English play written by uh, famous English playwright William Shakespeare uh, called The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, which was first performed uh, in 1599 CE, so, uh, much more recent than uh, the death of uh, Julius Caesar. Um, and during that play, uh, William Shakespeare penned the immortal line, beware the Ides of March, in which a soothsayer, a person who predicts the future, approaches Julius Caesar and says to beware the Ides. And that's the reason he's assassinated. And we know of some artifacts in the Penn Museum collection related to Julius Caesar. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, this is a gem. Uh, it's, you know, well after the Romans. Um, this, this gem is anywhere between... Um, uh, about two and three hundred years old, roughly estimated there, uh, with a carved bust of Julius Caesar. And on the right hand side is a marble statue head that is not of Julius Caesar, but appeared in a temple devoted to Julius Caesar uh, that was constructed roughly around 45 BCE, so about a year after Julius Caesar dies. And I thought in honor of the Ides of March, because we're actually doing this on the Ides today, that we would talk a little bit about Rome. Uh, and to do that, we're going to learn about a style of Roman art known as the mosaic. So that's what we're going to do today. And then by the end, we're going to design our own. So I hope you're all really excited. And so if we're going to take this journey together, we need to figure out where we're going. So why don't we get a map up here? Big old map of the world. Seven continents on this blue marble we all spin on. Uh, this Penn Museum is roughly right over here. Again, in Pennsylvania, in Lenape, Hoking, in Philadelphia. And so if we were going to take a trip to Rome... What continent should we go to? Oh, Brianna adding Europe. Anybody else want to add Europe? Anybody want to say a different continent? Uh, James also adding Europe. Uh, Jen saying go to Asia to go to Rome. Uh, Mila also adding we should go to Europe. Okay, let's see if anybody else, I'll give it another minute to see if anybody else jumps in. Where should we go? Should we go to Europe? Should we go to Asia? Should we go to maybe Antarctica? A 
Well, a bunch of you said Europe. And those of you who said, definitely not Antarctica, Jen said. But another person says, Barbara says Europe. Yeah, why don't we go to Europe? Yeah, we're going to Europe to go to Rome. Um, although, as Mila points out, Rome is in some cases bigger than one specific place. Uh, so why don't we start out with the city of Rome? We'll start there and then we'll expand outward as the Roman Empire did. Uh, so I've got a, a satellite map here of Europe, your uh, large continent, a lot of countries in Europe. Uh, it, roughly, where should we go? So I'm going to put up. Uh, I'm going to put up my pointer here, uh, and we'll do roughly cardinal directions. So north, south, east, west, or central. Where roughly in Europe should we go if we wanted to go to the city of Rome? Let's Rome can think Rome could be more than places. Hold on to that. I think that's a really sound observation. A bunch of people say in different places, southeast, south. I heard someone say west. James specifying a country saying in Italy. And if it's in Italy, where in where in Europe can you find it? And someone said the boot. Uh, so we've got here Europe. Uh, Europe is basically the stretch over here. And roughly, someone pointed out the boot over here. And anybody want to tell us what that boot is? What 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 is that now? What modern country is that boot right over there? Yeah, people say in Italy, and in the center of Italy, roughly right over here, is where we'll find Rome. Although the old saying is that all roads lead to Rome. Uh, but we're not going to take a road. We're going to fly there right now. So I hope you, I know all of you have your virtual bags are packed. You've got your virtual boarding pass. And so why don't we wave goodbye to the Penn Museum and take a flight to Rome. And so here it is on our map. And so let's take our trip today and fly all the way out to what is known as the eternal city of Rome. And let's learn a little bit about Rome. Because someone pointed out that the, the did not specify one specific continent. And that is also accurate. Uh, that is also technically correct, which is the best kind of correct. Uh, so let's learn a little. Fly off to Rome. And we'll start out with Rome. Rome, the city, uh, which is now the capital of Italy. And the city of Rome was founded along a river called the Tiber uh, in, modern, in what is now modern-day Italy. Uh, during uh, in 753 BCE, so about 2,700 years ago, Rome is founded. Uh, but Rome quickly became became something bigger than just one city. Uh, Rome became uh, a republic, uh, a, a representative government. It eventually became an empire, uh, expanding into ter other territories by about 264 BCE. The Republic eventually became an empire with the leader called an emperor in 27 BCE. The first emperor was Caesar Augustus. Um, and the empire expanded uh, dramatically, military conquest uh, through all parts, a lot of parts of the ancient Mediterranean world to the point that this was the height of the Roman territory. So those of you who said that Rome is in Asia, that Rome is in Africa, you're technically, again, technically correct because at one point, this was the first expanse of the Roman Empire, expanding as far east as places like modern day, uh, parts of modern day Iraq and Turkey, uh, as far south as places in Northern Africa. They conquered Egypt at one point, uh, and as far north and far west as England. Uh, uh, the Roman Empire had a very, very long territorial reach. Now, one of the challenges of holding this much territory is eventually that they couldn't hold on to it. Uh, and Rome went through decline. Uh, it went through various stages of crisis and eventually got so big that the empire was split in half. Uh, the Eastern, or also known as the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, which was based in a city called Constantinople, uh, and the Western Roman Empire, which is based in Rome. Now, eventually, the, Ro the Western Roman Empire fell in 476 CE, uh, so roughly about 1,600 years ago. But the Eastern Roman Empire stuck around for a little longer than that. It lasted until 1453 CE, uh, so very, very long time. Uh, Rome had an incredibly broad and long influence, uh, everything from elements of their culture, their government, their uh, architecture, 
uh, and things like their philosophy, their literature, uh, have a long reach to Rome and have inspired, for example, other countries. The United States, when it was founded uh, as a republic, borrowed a lot of inspiration from the Roman Republic. So it has a very long reach Rome. Um, and as a result of that, the Pen Museum has a pretty sizable collection of artifacts related to Rome, things that were collected all around the Mediterranean. Uh, these are just two examples here that are part of our Rome collection. Uh, we have this bronze crested helmet, which I just always think looks really, really cool. Uh, this one on the left-hand side here, um, which dates to about 725 BCE. So it's an old, one of the older things in fact, around roughly when the city is founded. Uh, and this thing over here on the right-hand side, which is an oinacho, uh, an oinacho is a type of wine jug. Uh, and this is from much more recent, uh, from the fourth century CE. So that's about uh, 300 to 399 uh, CE, uh, so about 1700 years ago. Uh, so still pretty old, though. Uh, we have a lot of collections. Our Roman Republic, our, our um our Rome gallery uh, spans a lot of different artifacts uh, related to the Mediterranean world. And so we're going to talk about one type of artifact here. We're going to talk about mosaics. And to do that, we are going to think like archaeologists. We are going to look at artifacts themselves and try to see what artifacts can teach us. And so why don't we take a look at two of them right here. So we're going to think like archaeologists because the most important tool for any archaeologist, I mean, all the other scientific tools they use, the most important is your powers of observation. So what we're going to do today is we're going to use those powers of observation. So what I want you to do is just take a close look at the things you see on the screen right here. And I just want you to tell me, what do you see? What do you notice? Someone point out a duck. Yeah, we see a duck here. A mallard duck, as Jen clarifies. Uh, a boat. Two men in a boat. Roman numerals, a duck mosaic, a lot of people noticing the duck, a sail. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is a mosaic. A lot of people pointing out the duck. I picked out the duck one because I just thought it looked really neat. Uh, lines, so is there a door? Little tiles. Why don't we take a closer look at some of those tiles? So I'll magnify our duck here and just take a close look so you can get, see anything else notice about them. Me lighting patterns on the material, the, the picture of the two men in the boat. I'll zoom over to that one too while we're adding these things. Keep adding observations, these are fantastic. All these kinds of things are what archeologists do. They start by just seeing what they notice. Uh, Caleb adding to see different color tiles. Jen also adding different shades of tiles. Matter of fact, I'll zoom in a little closer for this one on the left-hand side. So Mila asked, are they made out of gems and crystals? Why don't we explore that? What do you think they might be made of? You said, you see those little tiles on there. What do you think they might be made out of? Ooh, just, I mean, glass, maybe ceramic? Stone, marble? Clamshells? Lots of people making really fantastic observations. Mila adding also stone. So we think it's maybe maybe some hard material like clamshells or marble or stone, gems. You see those bright colors in them. Now here's, a, here's another question to think about. How do you think somebody made one of these things? Oh, very good question, my meal. Are they natural colors or are they painted on the tiles? Oh, Caleb said maybe they sewed them. Oh, maybe they, Jen is an interesting observation. Maybe they forge the tiles with heat. Maybe they heat them and they fuse together. Maybe brands is maybe they glue them. Maybe stamp them in. Ooh, maybe mortar. So like mixing like a like a concrete kind of thing where you maybe 
heart press them onto it. Isn't there a door on the side of the mosaic? Well, yeah, I can see that. That's a great observation right there. I'm gonna do a little bit of a bigger image of it so you can see uh, and magnify it there. Yeah, you can see it looks like the design of a doorway. Oh, someone added they might be made of tree sap. That's really interesting. Now, there, here's another thing. Where might you find one of these objects that we see here? So we see a stone piece. We can see it's made out of a lot of little pieces and when they're making different shapes and patterns, where do you think you might find one of these things? Meals is buried. Yeah, you might find it, maybe uncover it from somewhere. Where would someone put something like this? Ooh, a couple of people are saying like in fancy houses. Yes, I've seen mosaics in churches, on walls and pathways. Ooh, in a garden. Where Where do you think if you had one of these things where you would put it? Oh, maybe on the walls, a floor. Okay, where where do you think if if you if you were to put one of these like if you were to like own one of these things where would you put it? Ooh, do they make some of the tiles from fossils? Ooh, that's really interesting. Ooh, we put it up on the mantle. That's a conversation piece, huh? Ooh, in the kitchen. Ooh, on the path of a garden. I love all these ideas of where to put it. So as we start, oh, we'll put it in your bedroom. Oh, it'd be a very nice accent piece. You love the colors on these things. I think that's one of the coolest things about these mosaics. It's just the bright, vibrant colors. And what's really cool about that is that these are old artifacts. So this, this mosaic on the on the right hand side, this one of the duck. Oh, also Cosmo, did they use bone? We'll talk about materials in a moment. This figure of a duck on the right-hand side dates to the first century CE. So this is almost 2,000 years old. What I think is very, very cool about that is like, this is over 2,000 years old, and it still maintains a pretty robust color, especially when you see things like the, um, like the fur around, you know, the feathers around the head of the mallard. I think that's amazing how detailed it is. The, the brightness of the eye. And you can see it in the uh, the, the mural and the, uh, the mosaic on the left-hand side too. Again, the, the incredible level of color and detail. Um, this artifact on the right on the left-hand side is a little younger than the other one is. This dates from between about 200 and 250 CE. So it's about roughly 1800 years old. So it's still very old, but a little bit younger than the other one. Um, how did they get to be different colors? Why don't we talk about that? I think there's a lot of questions about how they make these things. So why don't we explore that a little bit and talk a little bit more about mosaics? Uh, so mosaics are examples of a style of decorative flooring uh, that became very popular among uh, throughout the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans did not initially develop mosaics. Uh, as it, someone pointed out, there are like little little stone or tile pieces that are assembled together that when they are assembled together, create a larger image. Almost like the one we thought about, like putting the other pieces of a puzzle. Uh, this is like a puzzle too. Um, mosaics date back to the Bronze Age. The idea of putting together stones into an arranged pattern this is particularly decorated on floors. Um, and this idea of creating these decorative stone patterns uh, dates back to the Bronze Age, which goes as far back as 2000 BCE, so over 4,000 years ago, um, and originally developed probably in Greece. But the Romans loved this design. It became very, very popular in the Roman Empire. Um, the mosaics cons are consist, consist of a, a, an arrangement of small squares. Uh, the small squares can be anywhere between a half centimeter and one and a half centimeters wide. Uh, that's for those of you on the royal system is about 0.2 and 0.6 uh, inches. Um, and the tiles can be made out of a bunch of different materials. Uh, this can include things like marble. A lot of the ones you, you, you pointed out. So things like marble and tile and glass. So like tile, like ceramic. Uh, and... Um, even things like pottery and stone and even shells could be used for these uh, to create these mosaics. And oftentimes they were of very specific colors. Uh, how was marble and stone made? The stone would have been uh, would have been gone, brought from quarries. Uh, they had people, particularly enslaved people, uh, would have worked in quarries. They're basically these large mines 
where they would harvest specific types of stone, marble that way too. Uh, and they would have to actually bring it out of the earth. Now, do you think that this is something that anybody could do? Do you think making one of these things, making these murals was something that anybody needed to do? Or is it something you had to be really skilled to do? You think you can just put one, put one together? Uh, yeah, a bunch of people are saying this is skilled work. Uh, is it a quarry if, it's a, if it isn't specific explosions? So quarries are usually, they're like a mine. They're where people discover a type of stone, a type of resource, and they mine it out. So people actually go in there and they'll strike stones to break pieces off and to bring back to use for lots of different types of things. Yeah, this is a skill job. It's what they call an artisan. An artisan is someone who is specially trained to do a job. And it's usually involves sort of like making something. Artisans would train with people who were already skilled to do that. And they would learn and they would practice how to do this. So when you really look, at, look, I'm going to have a, a run of video uh, briefly showing how to make this. And I'll kind of talk through it. Uh, this is created by the Art Institute of Chicago. I'm going to silence it though. And so the way that they would create a mural, murals for floor designs, they would start with kind of a base that would be made of stone or brick, which they would cover with a mixture, uh, which we would call mortar. It's kind of liquefied stone, uh, something like cement, like wet cement, uh, which they would use to create a nice flat layer. Um, and then once they create the layer, um, a person would generally start by using a specialized tool to trace the design uh, that they wanted the mural, to, the mosaic to be. Uh, to give them a rough guide. Uh, think of it like, uh, think of like if you've ever done a coloring book. Uh, you have the tracing, the design of the thing and then you color into it. And in this case, this particular person who's doing this is painting sections that they want to be specific types of tile and stone. Um, these would have been generally different colored materials, special stones, some of them were made of glass. Uh, so they would have made them color the glass in a specific way. So some of these cases, the pieces were made, and some of these cases, pieces were mined. Um, and so you can see here this person applying a little bit of pressure using a hammer and breaking it over a wedge and breaking those particular stone or glass or whatever pieces they are into small squares, what they call tesserae. And what they then do is they can break them in different sizes depending on the level of detail they want, and then they very carefully place them in the mortar into the arrangement of the shape that they want and putting special shapes into special places. Think about like, imagine if you do Lego and if you're trying to make a design out of Lego, you might decide that you wanna make it so that special pieces are different colors. And so this is kind of an example of that. And so you can see this person, they're creating an outline and once they fill it, what they'll then do is they'll take a stone called a pumice stone, which is kind of like a sanding stone, and they'll run it over the top of the stones to smooth and even it out. Because, you know, this is a floor. You don't want someone to trip on it. Uh, and so to make it nice and level, and then it creates this sort of beautiful, intricate design. Um, and these types of designs, again, they were very popular. They became a, a measure of status. For Romans, because, you know, if you put one in your house, it's made of very, you know, it's made of maybe expensive materials. It requires a lot of skill. Um, it's something to show off. It's a conversation piece. You would see these things, for example, in entryways and things like that. Uh, for example, one of the most famous mosaics people know of, examples of famous mosaics come from the city of Pompeii. Uh, does anyone know Pompeii? Anybody familiar with that name? Those of you who know what Pompeii is, what do you know about Pompeii? Yeah, James pointed out the thing most people know about Pompeii is the word volcano. So Pompeii was a prosperous Roman city that is roughly near where the modern day city of Naples is. And what happened is in 79 CE, uh, Pompeii, uh, Pompeii was near a very, very large volcano it goes Mount Vesuvius. And Mount Vesuvius had a catastrophic eruption. Uh, and it buried the city in a, a large, thick layer of volcanic material. And the city was lost for centuries and eventually was rediscovered by, uh, by Italians and during a building project uh, in Naples. And they found the city largely preserved uh, because of the volcanic ash. And one thing that it preserved were the, the, mur the mosaics on the floor. 
And this is one of the most famous ones. It's on an entryway. So it would be the first thing you see when the house, you want to put your best foot forward. So you have this fancy mural. Uh, and it's the one of a dog, which one I think is very neat because I love dogs. Uh, shout out if you have pet, uh, pets. Um, and what I love about this design is the intricacy of it too. And I love the writing. It says a Latin word. It says cave canum. Any Latin scholars amongst it? If anybody know, anybody want to guess, maybe based on the image that's there, maybe what cave canum might mean? Yeah, canum. Uh, canum is uh, the Latin word for dog. What does it look like the dog is doing? We'll try to do it by context. The economum or canine is the term for dog. So cave canum is a Latin term for beware of dog. And that might mean that a, literally a dog is there protecting the house or just they might be just be warning people, you know, try to be nice in our house here. Our house is protected. Uh, and so some of them are scenes of animals. Some of them are really intricate scenes too. Um, this is an example of another uh, mosaic that was found at Pompeii of a famous battle called the Battle of Isis, which was a battle of Alexander the Great. Um, and you can actually see Alexander the Great over here with his horse Bucephalus is on the uh, on the horse right over here. I'll put my pointer on him. Um, and this is just another really intricate and just look at, you can just barely make it out how small they are. These small, intricate, and can you imagine how long it would take to make something like this? That probably would have ha appeared in someone's house who was pretty well off. And mosaics, as you can guess, come in lots of different styles. Um, they're really interesting glimpses into, uh, into Roman life and things that they liked because they made designs that they enjoyed. So you'd see, for example, things like animals and birds. We saw the duck before. This is one on the left-hand side that was discovered in, in what's now modern-day Turkey, which again was part of the Roman Empire at one point, uh, of a peacock. Uh, uh, Romans loved peacocks. Here's another kind of examples of mythology. Um, mythical creatures and monsters. On the left-hand side, we see a mural containing two griffins. A griffin is a legendary creature, which is half lion and half eagle. Uh, on the right-hand side is a scene that we think might have been a scene from the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus was a prince of the Greek city of Athens uh, who went off to the island of Crete to battle a monster who was half human and half bull called the Minotaur. Uh, and this might be a depiction of him sailing back to Athens after de defeating the Minotaur. Uh, so they love to show stories on them. And they love, for example, uh, geometric patterns. If you ever, uh, you may have in your house a tile floor that might have just decorations like this. And so these kinds of checkerboard style patterns, like the one on the left-hand side here, or the squiggly line ones here too, uh, these are examples of things that people would have in their house because they thought it would look nice. And as someone pointed out, you see them in all sorts of other places, like gardens. You see them in churches. Uh, the style of mosaic became popular among cultures after the Roman Empire fell too. So these things are just incredibly intricately designed that teach us a lot about Roman life. One, we learn about a very, very skilled job. Uh, and we learn about a decorative art uh, that people love to have in their house. Like the things you like to have in your house to make them look nice. Uh, and that's the kinds of things that we learn about when we study things like mosaics. And what's really cool about mosaics is again, you get kind of a, a small glimpse into everyday life. In some ways you're going into a person's house, you're being welcomed into their home and you're seeing the things that they like to show off there, which I think is something we can all relate to. And so with that, I hope that we can all then use this for some inspiration. And so what we're gonna do for the remainder of our session is we're gonna make our own. And so what you're gonna need for this is you're going to need a blank sheet of paper, a writing utensil, ideally a pencil for this. I didn't mean to rhyme, but I'm glad I did. And some coloring materials. So I've got markers here. You can use colored pencils, you can use crayons. If you don't have coloring materials, that's fine too. Uh, we can make do without them as well. And so while you gather those materials together, I'm gonna to switch to my other camera.
Okay. All right, so while you're gathering those things up, I'm just gonna show you my materials I have here. I have my blank sheet of paper. It doesn't hurt to have something uh, something to write on, especially if you're doing this on like a table. I don't want to leave any stains on my table here. So I've got a notepad I'm doing on top of, uh, but whatever work surface you have. Um, I've got my writing utensil. I've also got a marker if I want to make it, uh, if I want to, you know, immortalize my images here. And then I've got a selection of coloring materials. I've got red, uh, blue, and green here. Uh, but you can have whatever colors you want. And so we are going to do like uh, a mosaic designer would. And what we're going to first start by doing is creating an outline of our drawing, of our image, uh, which we are going to then create our mosaic with. And so what I want you to do, if you're thinking of inspiration, think about something you'd want to show off in your house. Or it could be something you really like. Uh, that duck is inspiring me. Uh, so I think I'm going to make a bird. I think I'm going to make an owl, actually. Owls are kind of easy designs to make, too. So I'm going to do an owl. You can do whatever design you want. Um, but I'm going to do, uh, this inspires me. Uh, and the weather's getting nice. You see a lot of you know bright sunshine. You'll see more animals out uh, with spring coming. And so I'm going to make an owl. And you can make an owl simply by a couple of shapes. And as I always say, uh, people if people are self-conscious about their drawing skills, um, one, whatever you make is going to be awesome because you made it. And number two, one way to think about drawing is as a series of shapes. So my owl, to start with an owl, we start with a circle for the head and then more of an oval for the body. And then I'm going to make another small oval here and here. Those are gonna be my wings. And then I'm gonna make a couple of more little ovals here and some straight lines here. These are gonna be the feet of my owl. Uh, oh, Mill's gonna make a cat, that's wonderful. Again, animals were very popular among the Romans. And another thing I do, I'm going to make a little trapezoid, just like this. Trapezoid is a set of parallel lines um, with two angle lines with them, too. So I have my little trapezoid. It's going to be the back of the tail. And then what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start erasing the lines that overlap so that we can start seeing our shape in more detail. And again, this can be whatever you want it to be. So I'm going to erase that. Erase that here. Erase the top line of my trapezoid. So we have a little bit of perspective. And so that's behind the, put that ball. No, I didn't want to erase that line. This is why we use pencil. And pencils are really handy for this because you get to get rid of the tra the tracing lines we had. And what's cool about when you design it like this with shapes, as you erase, you begin to see the shape come together. So let's make them like little clawed feet. Owls are birds of prey uh, because they hunt other animals. There we go. I made them look more like web feet. I didn't intend to do that. But there we go. Uh, okay. And so then we're going to make, oh, Rebecca's going to make a hippo. I'm sure it's going to look fantastic. Owls are known for big eyes. So I'm going to make two big round. Make them a little bit, like it's smiling a little bit. And then I'm going to make a beak. And of course, owls often like, you think of like the great horned owl, they have the little horns, the feathered horns at the top. And then I'll make a shape for the belly. 
Get a little different shape than the rest of it. If we're talking about mythology, the Greeks had a uh, the symbol the symbol of Athena, the god of war and goddess of war and wisdom, was the owl. All right. And so once we have our basic shape, oh, someone's making a snake. Um, you can, Millie, yes, if you can do a cat sitting down, you can do whatever design you want. Uh, it's your mural. So whatever you want to do, I'm just making it out. And so the next thing we'll do, once you're happy with your, your overall state, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do like the wood for a mural, except we're going to do it with markers. And an easy way to think about a uh, mosaic, sorry, I said mural, I mosaic, is to think of it as a series of small dots. Now, there's another way you can make mosaics, too, if you have the materials. Uh, you can make one with construction paper. If you have different construction paper and you feel okay with cutting out lots of little square pieces and gluing them onto a piece of paper, you can do that, too. This one's a little bit less messy. Uh, I also don't like cutting that many tiny pieces. And so if you want kind of the illusion of that, you can pick different sections like we saw in the design. And I'm going to identify them with different colors. Mine's going to be a very oddly colored uh, owl. It's going to be red with blue on its belly. And I'm going to have the beak is going to be green and the feet's going to be green too. So I'm making these colors here to identify what sections are going to be which. And then what I'm going to do, make little dots. This is where a marker might be, might be a useful thing to have, but you could also just crayon, just make little circles. You can do like that. I'm just dabbing it with my marker. And then as we go in, and it's okay if it doesn't completely fill in because remember, you sometimes, a lot of times you see the mortar, the thing that's holding them together in between. So you make little, little dots and dabs. Can be very soothing. I'm going to go a little quickly. You can go and take your time on this, but I know we're almost close to time, so I want to at least have something to show you. So I'm going to move a little quickly here. Again, you can go at your own pace, whatever time you have to work with. Let's see it. Oh, I'll make you a unicorn. Oh, that's very cool. I bet if the Romans knew about unicorns, they would have made unicorns too. Okay, so I've decided I'm going to leave the belly white just to, to let it be a little bit more pronounced. Since I already made a line there, I'll make like a little heart on it. And then we'll make the feet green. Ooh, Wisteria. That's a very pretty name. It's going to make the beak green. It's a very Christmas colored owl. And then we'll make the eyes blue.
Did I do the tail? Yeah, I made I made my tail feathers at the bottom here. See. Okay. And so, what should we name our red our red owl? And it could be I picked an animal. You can make any scene you like. You could make. Again, remember we saw the battle scenes. We saw the dog, beware of dog. Ooh, Alice, Jenny. Oh, very pretty names. Albert. I think it has to be Albert. I think that's a very nice name for our owl. So I'm gonna make Albert. Uh, Jaquies, Albert Jacques. I like that, Albert Jacques. In honor of William Shakespeare, Jacques, Jacques or Jacques, I believe as he's pronounced, a uh, character from the play As You Like It, is the one who said all of the world's a stage. And so that is my, that is my mosaic. I'd love to hear uh, what kinds of designs people have been making. Uh, so why should we from? Oh, damn, I made a dog, dogless. I love that. I love a good pun. Okay, and teacher Allison has put a place in the chat uh, where you can go ahead and share us your, I, what I know are going to be incredible designs. So I'm sorry, I accidentally had my screen share the whole time. So you saw me making it in a tiny screen. Uh, sometimes we learn as we go. Uh, so why don't we, um, we have only like a minute, a minute or two left. So I'd love to hear if anybody has any questions. Jensen, the set, making a morning dove sewing. Oh, that must be very interesting. Why did the mosaics become so popular during the Roman times? I'm not sure exactly why specifically um, they became popular. I mean, the design is very striking. I think they like the way it looked. It is an, a nice way of showing off if you want to be like, you know, showing off your wealth. Well, I can afford nicely designed glass. I can make, I can afford, you know, things like ceramic. I mean, ceramic is generally cheaper, but like, I think people like art. I think people have always liked art. And I think people like that as a kind of personal expression that people would make their own unique ones or have their own unique ones made uh, for somewhere there. Because we all, I think we've always liked doing that. We always like kind of artistic expression and things that make us un feel unique. Can I show my owl again? Absolutely, I can show my owl. And this time I'll actually show properly the, um, the big screen design of it. All right, so let me switch my camera over. Stop my share. So yeah, there you go. I give him a little blue heart design. Uh, Mila is asking for suggestions about what color to make their cat. So feel free to share that in the chat. What what what, what do we think that this cat should be? Pink. Oh, a pink cat. Orange. You can make it like a tabby cat where it's got stripes. And I'm just gonna bring up because you know we're just about at time. And if you like this, I hope you'll check us out next week uh, when we'll be honoring, continuing to honor Women's History Month um, by learning about the oldest known written, the oldest known author, the oldest known person with a writing credit uh, who is an age, a priestess uh, from Mesopotamia named Enaduhana. And we'll learn about ancient writing and we'll learn about Enaduhana. And so with that, I hope you'll check us out. Uh, Teacher Allison has put a link in the registration. I've got a QR code up on the screen. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Teacher Allison. Hey, thank you, Teacher Kevin.
I'm so excited uh, for our program today. And also, I apologize. I had my two screen setup set up. So you were big for me on both sides. So I apologize. I didn't ask you to uh, drop your uh, drop the screen there. But thanks for showing that big version of your wonderful Al. And like you said, we um, not only dropped our link into the chat for you to be able to share with us, via email, but we also just dropped the link to the program that teacher Kevin will be with us to teach next week. And you can see that QR code right there as well on the screen. We want to remind you that you do not have to stop your learning with teacher Kevin and his team. Instead, you can dive into so many different topics with teacher Kevin and the Penn Museum. I just dropped their member link into the CIL, into the um, page there, into the chat. And you can check out all of their different program offerings. You can even have your cameras and your microphones on. You can have that with your group, your classroom, however you'd like to jump in. It's super fun. We also want to remind you that next week we are back and we are going to be celebrating women's history in so many different ways. We are here Tuesday to Friday at the same time we met We met all of you here today. So that's 1 p.m. Eastern for me. We're going to be talking about powerful women in the arts, specifically in photography. We're going to be talking about powerful women in the sciences. We're going to be meeting Helen Keller's great grand niece to learn more about her life. And then we're back here with teacher Kevin to talk about the earliest known author that happens to be a female priestess. So we can't wait to learn again with you, teacher Kevin. And we can't wait to learn again with all of you that are here today this week. It's been so wonderful to hear all of your questions, observations, all of the wonderful conversations and help you've been giving one another as well. It's so great. So we want to say have a great, great weekend. Enjoy yourselves, have fun. And we look forward to learning along with you again again next week. Bye everyone. Thank you again, teacher Kevin. See you next week. Take care, everybody. Thank you.